So we want to see a few more applications of the greedy methodology. Can I have your attention, please? Um, and then we will do um, some practice problem uh, from the material that we have covered and that you will have uh, on the midterm, right? So uh, we posted on the web uh, a list of 28 problems, but you can find many more in your textbook, both uh, uh, solved exercises and uh, uh, exercises uh, without answers for you to practice. So I urge you to try to uh, do as many problems uh, as possible to prepare for, for, the, uh, for the midterm. And even though there is this uh, mid-semester break, next week um, I'll have uh, office hours as usual and I'll have an extra office hours on Friday so that um, you can ask me questions, okay? So, um, on the midterm, you can expect to see, um, you know, the, everything that we have covered, so mostly divide and conquer, some basic uh, stuff about fast Fourier transform, and um, large integer multiplication, multiplication of polynomials, uh, and of course, uh, uh, greedy. So, and this is, uh, so the, the problems that we have posted are pretty kind of typical of uh, what you can expect, okay? So one of the most important applications of greedy methodology is uh, uh, for graphs. And uh, so let us consider the following problem. So you have a, um, a directed graph and a particular vertex u, um, and uh, each edge, uh, uh, each edge i j uh, has weight uh, w i j, right? So you have the weight uh, for uh, each of the directed edges. And your task is to find, uh, so find for all uh, V that belong to G, uh, the shortest uh, path uh, from Uh, from u to v. Now here, shortest path does not refer to the number of edges, but uh, some total um, uh, e uh, path uh, such that the sum of uh, weights i, j, so that the edge i, j belongs to that path, P uh, is uh, minimal. And we are assuming here, uh, in order for greedy to work, that all the weights are uh, non-negative. If there are negative weights, uh, um, uh, one has to use a more sophisticated method that we will cover later uh, in the course. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this problem can be solved very effectively and very elegantly uh, using uh, um, a greedy method. Of course, this is called uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. And idea is uh, 
the following. We will be adding uh, vertices in stages uh, one at a time. Uh, so we will build a set S that has the following property. The shortest path from a vertex U to any vector, uh, vertex, uh, say, J, uh, through the, in this graph actually uh, goes entirely through the vertices that are in S, right? So these vertices will all have property that if you look at all possible paths in the whole graph G and you choose the shortest, all the intermediate vertices will belong to uh, S. Initially, uh, we start with S equal just the vertex U, right? Now, the algorithm proceeds recursively. So assume that we have built already um, at, at some stage, uh, say k, we have built a set S with k many vertices. What we do next is we look at all the vertices that are outside of S. So look at all vertices outside S, right? And for these vertices, uh, look what is the shortest path to that vertex such that all intermediate vertices belong to S. So it's not overall shortest path, but we only look um, for paths so that all intermediate vertices belong to S, so it might look something like, like that. And among such paths, we pick the shortest one for each of the vertices. And then among all remaining vertices, we pick one whose sh uh, shortest path is shortest among all of that, these paths. So we have two stage minimizations. For minimization. First, for every vertex outside of S, you look at the shortest path. So this wouldn't be a correct, right? So here, for example, this would be a correct path. So we look at all paths whose intermediate points all belong to S, and we choose the shortest one. And then among all these vertices, we pick one that has, among these shortest paths, the shortest, the one of the smallest possible weight, right? So each vertex uh, is, uh, will have an associated shortest path with all vertices in S, and among all the vertices, we pick one that has the shortest such path, right? And we add it to S. So outside S, pick uh, for each such vertex uh, the shortest uh, path Uh, whose uh, all intermediate uh, vertices uh, belong to S uh, among all vertices uh, outside 
S pick the one uh, with shortest pass with shortest such path. Uh, wait. such path and add it to S. Right. So among all of these vertices, let's draw the picture again here. If this is your S that you already constructed, for each, this is your U, for each, Vertex V, look for the shortest path to that vertex so that all intermediate uh, nodes belong to S. And then among all such vertices outside S, pick the one for which the shortest such path is as short as possible. Okay. Now, this looks like a pretty, uh, the, the doesn't look at the first sight very promising what the complexity of uh, the algorithm will be. Namely, first we look for each vertex, what is the shortest path with all vertices in U, and then uh, we look, we scan through all vertices outside and choose one with the shortest, so it looks like there will be lots of calculation, but we will leave at the moment this aside and we will show that this can be done actually remarkably efficiently, right? But uh, let us now show that uh, such a greedy strategy uh, indeed uh, uh, produces uh, the, shortest possible, the shortest path for all vertices in S. And you keep doing that until you exhaust the whole graph, namely until S grows to be equal to G, where there is nothing outside the G, right? So why does this algorithm, it's not completely obvious why it produces uh, um, the shortest path, right? Well, <clears throat> take a vertex and look at the moment when it was added to the set S. Assume that the produced path is not the shortest path. Right, so we go contrapositive. <coughs> Assume that there exists a vertex uh, for which we did not correctly produce the, a shortest path, right? Um, Consider the stage of construction when this vertex was added to S, right? Uh, since, and assume that there is a shorter uh, path, maybe something that looks like this. Well, because this vertex is outside of the set S produced just before adding W to, uh, to this set, uh, it cannot all belong to, to S, right? Because uh, if it did belong all to S, we would have added uh, uh, that uh, edge rather than this edge if this path was shorter, right? So there would be points outside of S. Well, look at the first point when uh, the shortest path leaves S, right? Well, but notice now, if this is the shortest path, shorter than the path that we constructed, then just this piece up to V will be shorter than this path, right? Because it is just a path, all the, this is where we use the fact that all weights are positive, right? This is a sub path of this path, 
the length of this path is the length of that path to V plus the path from V to W, and this is non-negative, right? So the length of this path uh, is shorter than the length of the whole path, and we assume that this whole path is shorter than the path we have constructed. But then the path from U to V would be shorter than the path from U to W. And this contradicts our construction because at each stage of the construction, we always add uh, such a vertex so that the shortest path through uh, S to that uh, vertex V is as short as possible. Uh, by the way, this is all in, I guess, both textbooks, but it's extremely nicely explained in um, Kleinberg and Tardos uh, textbook. Just look for the shortest path. Okay, so this shows that uh, the algorithm is correct, but how to implement it in a very efficient way, right? Well, the idea is uh, to keep a priority Q Right, um, uh, where the priority of each, uh, so priority Q of vertices outside S. Where the priority of each vertex is the length of uh, its shortest path uh, with uh, all intermediate. vertices belonging to S, right? So the uh, priority of each vertex will be set to the shortest, to, to the length of the shortest path to that vertex so that all intermediate points belong to S. Okay, so how do we implement uh, uh, such priority queue? Uh, what is the most convenient structure for priority queues? Uh, hip, that's right. The best, so what is a hip? Let me quickly remind you. Hip is a binary structure. Right? That has the property, if you consider uh, any uh, element u and uh, uh, elements, uh, say, v and w, then the priority, uh, did I have a variable for priority? Okay, let's call uh, priority of u is strictly, is smaller or equal than priority of v and uh, p of u is smaller or equal than priority of uh, w. So priority of u, well, it's kind of a bit, might sound counterintuitive, uh, smaller the priority, smaller the number, higher the priority, right? The first priority is the highest priority. So as priority index increases, the actual priority decreases, right? So why do we uh, like uh, 
hips because uh, uh, hips are extremely easy to maintain. Uh, how long does it take to remove the mean value of a hip? Log n. Log n, exactly. So all the major operations uh, take log n many times. If I remove this element, I take the last leaf, put it on the top, and then sink it wherever its proper place, right? Very good. Now, uh, the hip structure uh, to be used as a cue can be enhanced a little bit uh, with a few tweaks uh, uh, to kind of have a, a more, uh, more um, operations uh, con uh, that are convenient and uh, efficient. Uh, with a hip, we can also maintain, oh, how do we implement usually a hip? That's right, an array, uh, and uh, if you have an element A, I, uh, at position I, its children are at uh, position 2I and 2I uh, uh, plus 1, right? Uh, so, and of course, uh, if you have any um, element J, its uh, parent uh, is just the uh, floor of j divided by 2. That will be um, its parent, right? Now, to this array, you can also keep another array in which for every uh, element uh, you you, um, uh, you, have, uh, you have its index, uh, so uh, you keep index of that element in uh, the uh, queue, in the array uh, for the queue, for uh, or uh, in the array for the heap, right? So uh, for any element, for example, element that sits here, I record uh, um, uh, where it, its index in the array is. And why is this useful? Because it allows us a constant time access if I if I'm looking for a particular element uh, in this array, I can find its index and immediately access that element. Uh, this comes handy if you want to manipulate the priorities. Uh, if you want to, if you do something and you want to update the priority, you simply find where that element is, uh, change its index, and then either push it up or sink it down, depending whether the new uh, priority is uh, higher or lower, right? So how do we proceed here? Well, as we build the set S, we keep all of the uh, elements which are outside in a priority heap where they're uh, priority is precisely the length of the shortest path to this element that goes through S. Now, when you add a new vertex, uh, then the only elements uh, whose priority can change uh, are those uh, that have edges from that element to these elements. Uh, why is this so? Well, uh, the, the shortest path to an element, uh, if it contains this node, uh, can only contain it as the last node on the shortest path preceding V, right? Why is this so? Because these elements were added before, and their shortest paths are entirely within previously constructed S, uh, because this is how we build. So as you add a new element, you only have to inspect 
a few vertices and see whether the shortest path to this vertex plus this length is shorter than the previous path. If it's shorter than the previous path, then you go to your queue and change accordingly the priority and push that element up, right? Uh, if uh, the shortest path through this, if the path through this element is not the shortest, then you don't have to do anything. So how many updates you have? You have as many updates as you have edges. Because each edge can be used for update only once. So the total runtime of algorithm is number of edges times a log of the number of vertices. So T of uh, uh, a graph G uh, with uh, uh, M, uh, sorry, with N ver vertices and M edges uh, is equal to O of uh, M times uh, log N. And this is, in fact, a very efficient uh, algorithm. Of course, when you are looking for shortest paths, you will have to inspect all the edges. But the extra work besides that is only a factor of log n, which of course grows very slowly uh, with respect to n. And usually n is uh, orders of magnitude smaller than m. So this is actually, in fact, uh, um, a very efficient algorithm. So please read uh, the, detailed, uh, uh, the details once again in the textbook because it's really both the proof of correctness and the implementation details are really very typical how truly useful and important greedy algorithms work. Okay, so next construction we want to consider is the minimum spanning tree. And I used to assume that all of this is a known uh, material, but it turns out that no one tells you how to implement um, the Kraskal construction efficiently. So uh, let's go over, over the algorithm once again and prove its cor uh, correctness. And uh, see how to implement it in an efficient way. Okay, so this time around, we will assume that we have an undirected graph. Right? And in this undirected graph, we want, we have each edge has its weight, just like before, edge ij uh, has weight uh, w of ij, which uh, is uh, bigger or equal than zero. And the goal is to find a minimal a tree uh, that connects all of these uh, vertices, right, uh, that has minimal weight. How do we do that? Huh? Anyone remembers the Traskell algorithm? So we start with all edges by themselves, right? And then we sort the list of all edges according to their weight. And then we do the following. Uh, as we go through this list, when we hit a particular edge, we look whether this edge 
belongs to the same, uh, whether the two vertices, the two endpoints, belong to the same connected component or if they don't. Right, so essentially the idea is uh, you will, oh my. The leash is too short. Okay. I should get one of these wireless uh, microphones. Um, I'll tell you a really embarrassing story. I used to have a wireless mic, mic and I was teaching and then my tummy went berserker. So I said, let's make five minute break and I ran away to the bathroom. <laughs> I did not disconnect the mic. <laughs> After that, I like experience. I like being on a leash. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, as we would start, uh, right? We would look for the shortest edge, uh, and lo and behold, uh, we will then take this edge to be part of the spanning tree, but we will change the label of the edge. As, remember, we started with uh, all uh, vertices being labeled by, just by themselves. So the height vertex has index i. Now, if, say, uh, vertex 5 and vertex 12 are the edges of the shortest uh, uh, edge, right? I can change uh, this uh, label from 12 to 5. And as I go along, uh, if, I, if this is one connected component, so far with the accepted edges, and this is another connected component and say I am considering whether I should add this edge. Well, if the label of this vertex is not equal to the label of that vertex, I do join them and I change uh, labels in one of the components to be exactly equal to the label of the other component. And I keep doing that until I have only one component left. I can keep track of how many components I've got. And once I hit uh, that there is only one component, I, can, I stop the construction and I claim that this is a minimal uh, spanning tree. Now, for the simplicity, let's assume that all weights are distinct. This is not absolutely necessary. You can tweak the algorithm to work <coughs> when there are equal weights because you can break uh, events, even weights in arbitrary order. But let's just assume that all the weights are distinct. So this is a strictly increasing list. Okay, uh, because the reason is that if all the weights are distinct, one can show that there is a unique spanning tree. While if there can be several, if uh, uh, some weights can be equal, there might be multiple uh, minimal spanning tree, namely spanning tree with exactly the same minimal weight. So let us first, Again, let us not worry about the implementation. And this also looks uh, that it will be lots of work because whenever you add a new edge, you have to revise uh, all the labels for all the nodes uh, in one of the two components that you are joining. So we will have to see how to do this efficiently. But uh, let us first prove 
that this construction indeed produces a minimal spanning tree. Why would that be so? Well, assume opposite, right? Assume opposite, assume that there is a better, lighter uh, spanning tree. Well, this spanning tree obviously then was not produced by the greedy algorithm, right? Because we assume it's better than the one produced by the greedy algorithm. What does this mean? Now, the same trick as in previous uh, arguments of optimality of greedy algorithm. If it's not produced by greedy algorithm, then there exists a first place. If you start running Kraskal, then there will be the first place where you produce an edge that is different from the greedy choice, right? So eventually, uh, you, there will be an edge that was in the um, classical uh, construction, but this tree didn't take this. Well, uh, this edge. Well, let's add this edge to the minimum spanning tree that we constructed. If we add this edge, right, to a tree, it will produce a, a loop, right? Now, is it possible that all these edges from the loop appear in the list before that edge? Is it possible that all these lists, so this is the edge that was not added, all previous edges were added. When you consider your, um, this better spanning tree and you consider the loop which this edge will produce, is it possible, for example, in this case, that both of its edges appear here? No, why? Exactly, because this is the next edge to be added by Kraskal construction. But if it would produce a loop, that's not possible because we always join only the points that are in different components. So in this loop, there must be an edge that in the list appears after the edge that wasn't added. But what can I do now to get a, a, a contradiction? How can I show that this tree cannot be optimal? Exactly. I can remove this longer edge and leave this edge on and produce a tree whose total weight is smaller because uh, this edge has a larger weight than that one and it was replaced by a lighter edge so the whole uh, tree would be uh, lighter. So that's a contradiction, which means that, lo and behold, the Kraskal theorem produces at the minimal spanning tree. Okay, so now we have to see how to implement uh, Kraskal construction in an efficient way. And the trick is to use a structure that is useful in many other situations, a situation that is called union find. Okay. So what is a union find? It's essentially a structure uh, that uh, um, for each element uh, returns the component to which uh, this element belongs, right? So you have a set of points and you have uh, uh, a collection of sets, and for each element x, union find of x uh, produces uh, the 
label of the set containing x. So how do we do this efficiently? So notice in the case of the Kraskal uh, construction, uh, when we have an edge, we would ask our union find uh, function uh, which is the label of this element, to which set it belongs. So which is the label of this element? We will ask which is the label of that element, right? And then if they are distinct, we will merge these two sets together. Namely, we will change the labels of all elements in one of these sets into a new label. Okay, how do we uh, do that? Well, you want to minimize, to, you want to optimize the efficiency. When you do the joining, which set will you choose to change the uh, labels? The smaller one. So the idea is always choose the smaller set to um, how to implement uh, union find. Well, you can essentially, the idea is uh, uh, to have an array in which all elements sit and then you have pointers for the labels and the labels will be always the particular chosen representative from that set. So initially, uh, all the labels, oh, sorry, all the pointers point to themselves, right? So, um, assume then that you have, uh, um, that we have constructed uh, label as we, uh, labels as we progress, right? So the idea is the following. Say I join uh, these two elements, uh, right? So I change the label of one of them. But later I join this element with or these two elements by another element. So I will have another pointer, right? Now the new pointer for this element will be obtained to find its label. You follow for as long as you can the pointers until there are no outgoing pointers. And this will be the label for, uh, um, for your set, right? And so now the question is, uh, when you want to find the label of this element, how many pointers will you have to traverse at most? Hmm? Let's see, each time when you do joining, the set in which you were, right, if it changed, if you have to change the label, that set was of smaller size than the set that you are changing the label to, right? So the set each time when you join these two sets, right? When you join these two sets into a new set, uh, because you are following the pointer, it means that uh, the pointer was, uh, the label was taken from the other set. So essentially from this set, you will have the label to the resulting set, which will be larger. And then once again, these two will be joined and so forth. But notice, when you join these two sets, the size of the resulting set is at least twice the size of that set. Because you always pick the label of the larger set. When you do the next joining, then the size of the resulting set will be at least 
twice the size of this set because you are adding a larger set, so the resulting set will have at least double the element. So each following each pointer means in the corresponding picture that your set kept doubling. How many times can you double the size, the, a number before you log, log many? So you see, um, the, in this way, you will, uh, the function union find will only take at most log n, uh, sorry, uh, uh, log two of n uh, many operations, right? Um, and of course, when you join two sets, if you join this set with that set, you only add a pointer uh, to this uh, new set, and of course, uh, the only work needed is to find the corresponding two elements, and then in constant time, you add a new pointer. So each operation costs you only log many uh, steps. So uh, this type of union find guarantees uh, that uh, each operation will be logarithmic in n. So the complexity of your algorithm, well, first you ha it's m log m, right? Because you had to sort the edges, all the edges, right? And then uh, for each edge, you, produce, you do log 2n uh, many, um, uh, many operations, right? To, uh, for uh, union find and for joining. So, okay, now there is an extra uh, tweak to make the efficiency even higher. Each time you use union find, you do the following step. Once you find the destination, you backtrack and replace all these pointers by direct pointers to the very end. So that even these log n many steps at each stage of construction can be done only once. And then next time you have to find the label of this element, it will be a constant, just a single uh, constant time operation. Okay, so that's about it, what we are going to cover uh, about greedy. So this is also in the textbook, please uh, read it carefully. Uh, next hour and tomorrow we will do uh, examples from past midterms uh, uh, so that uh, I, you get some practice. And uh, uh, please uh, try to solve as many as possible problems from the textbook to prepare yourself for the midterm. So let's make five minute break and then we continue. <laughs>